Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the, the second tutorial on uh, reinforcement learning. Um, so I'm to inform you that this session will be recorded. So in case you ask a question by audio, that, that will also be recorded. So at the end of the, the, the tutorial, you can ask questions either in the chat or by, by audio, your choice. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Matthew Geist, uh, who um, will talk about regularization in reinforcement learning. So uh, Matthew uh, obtained his uh, his uh, PhD from um, from a university called the Paul Batlen, I think, in Metz, and, uh, and then he was in fact working for many years together with Olivier Petit-Pierkan at, at Saint Paul Supélec. And uh, more recently, he he moved uh, to uh, to go to Google Brain in, in Paris. So, Mathieu, please go ahead. Thank you. I'll turn off uh, the video during the talk to for, for problem of internet connection. But uh, if uh, you want to ask questions during the talk, I should be monitoring the, the discussion panel. Uh, so feel free to ask a question during the talk. So I talk about regularization in, in reinforcement learning. And uh, here is an overview of the talk. I'll start with a warm up, uh, record some uh, background about reinforcement learning and uh, approximate dynamic programming. And then we'll see how we can frame uh, regularization through the lens of uh, approximate dynamic programming which allow recovering a lot of uh, algorithms derived from a different point of view. And we'll uh, see uh, two specific cases to, to see how we can go back from the approximate uh, dynamic programming viewpoint, which is quite abstract to practical algorithm uh, with uh, entropy organization and compact algorithm organization. Uh, and I will uh, provide uh, an overview of hopefully all the way to do regularization uh, which will be quite quick, thanks to the abstraction. And uh, I'll finish by saying what's the issue with, with uh, Kubak level organization and how to counter this problem. So we'll start from uh, dynamic programming and uh, go to deep reinforcement learning and then back to dynamic programming. So reinforcement learning is a closed loop control problem. You have an agent here that observes the state of the system or the state of the environment, and it will apply uh, an action. And resulting uh, to this action, the system will change its state, and the agent will be rewarded for this transition. And the goal of the agent will be to maximize its cumulative rewards. And the thing about reinforcement learning is that the control is learned from data and it's formalized with Markov decision processes. So an MDP is a set of states, a set of action. The states are the possible configuration of the system. The action are uh, what you can do to change the state of the system. Uh, the probability transition is a Markovian transition kernel that tells you in what state you will end up when applying an action in a given state. Uh, and it's Markovian because uh, it's stochastic, but uh, the probability of uh, moving to a new state depends on the state and not the path followed to reach the state. You have a raw function that depends on a real state action couple and a discount factor that will wait a uh, future outcome. So this model, um, the dynamics and uh, the criterion you want to optimize uh, through gamma and through the reward. And the policy would be a mapping from states to a probability distribution of our action. I will consider mostly stochastic policies uh, in this talk. And the, so to know how good is a policy, we quantify the quality of a policy with a value function. And the value function for a given state and a given policy is the expectation uh, among uh, possible future trajectories, and the stochasticity, stochasticity on trajectories uh, is linked to the dynamics of the system and uh, the stochasticity of the policy, of the cumulative sum of discounted rewards, and the rewards are discounted by gamma, given that you start uh, in a given state. 
And the optimal policy is the one that will maximize uh, the value function component-wise. So this quantity exists. And to compute the optimal policy, this is a problem of reinforcement learning. But before that, uh, it's a problem of uh, dynamic programming. And reinforcement learning is mostly dynamic programming from data. So to compute an optimal policy, uh, we'll uh, use a set of additional tools. The first one is a Q function or state action, state action value function that will be convenient. So it's, it looks like the value function, except that uh, you add the degree of freedom for the first action to be taken. So it's a expected cumulative discounted reward when starting in state S and taking action A and following the policy pi after what? That is uh, starting in S prime, the new state, uh, you, you follow the policy pi. And you have a kind of uh, backward uh, induction here. So the Q value is the expectation of the sum of uh, discounted reward. But if you break this sum in two terms, the first one is just the reward you get for taking action A instead S. And the second term is the expectation, but starting from time T uh, greater than one. And you can uh, factorize this by gamma, uh, compute the probabilities. So it will be the reward plus gamma, the expectation according to the next state, knowing that you start in S, state S and you choose action A. And the expectation according to the next action, given that you follow the policy pi uh, starting from S prime of the Q value in this next state. And here, what you have is a fixed point problem. You have Q pi in the left hand side and Q pi in the right hand side. And this is indeed the Bellman operator. And this Bellman operator associated to each uh, Q function, the reward plus gamma, the expected Q value in the next state, action couple. And Q pi will be the fixed point of this Bellman operator. So these are quite uh, usual thing if you, if you know a bit of reinforcement learning. So I will focus in this talk on one specific algorithm, which is value iteration. So to define value iteration, uh, we need the notion of greediness. A policy will be greedy according to a Q function. If you put a probability of one, if the action is maximizing the Q value for the given state, and the probability of zero else. And here I assume that um, ties are broken, that is one action is maximizing, but if you have more than one action maximizing, you can put uh, arbitrary probabilities on the action maximizing. And this means that the Q value in the next state gives you a, a kind of value and you, you trust this value as being an accurate estimate of what you can earn from the transiting state. And you will just uh, reduce the multi-step optimization problem to a one-step optimization problem by just saying, I choose the action that will uh, maximize my cumulative reward, assuming that this V is accurate of what uh, will happen uh, in the future. So this is value iteration. Um, it's an iterative algorithm. And at each iteration, you compute the policy pi case plus one that will be greedy according to the Q function QK. And then you update the Q function by applying the Bellman evaluation operator on it. So if you write it component-wise, I, I will use mainly this notation, uh, the one which is uh, in yellow, but component-wise to make things clear, you choose the action that puts a probability of one on the action. Uh, you choose the policy that puts a probability of one on the action maximizing the Q value, and then you update your Q function uh, applying the Bellman operator as before. So just to make things clear, um, VI, so value iteration in more classic form is that you compute reward plus gamma, the max over action of the next Q value. But this is equivalent because the policy here, this expectation is according to a probability that, uh, to a policy that would put a probability of one on the action maximizing. So it's a max, but I will put some organization in it. So it will no longer be a max. 
So we have value iteration, and uh, value iteration is an algorithm that will converge to exa the exact solution at a given rate, and so on and so on. But the thing is that we want to work from data. And in reinforcement learning, we have three main issues. The first one is that the model is unknown. That is, we, we don't know uh, the probability of S prime knowing S and A, and we don't know the reward. What we do is that we observe uh, transitions that are rewarded. So we, we learn from data. And the state action spaces are too large for representation uh, of the exact uh, quantities, be it uh, the policy or the Q value. Uh, for example, I think uh, in the previous talk, Olivier talked about uh, Atari games, where the input is an image, and uh, you cannot uh, have a tabular representation of this. So if we go back to the equation, the first problem is that the, the model is unknown, so we cannot compute this expectation, but we can sample a next state uh, from a given state action couple. So we can replace this uh, expectation by an empirical expectation with only one sample. Uh, we learn from data, so we cannot apply this equation to all state action pairs. We'll have a sub-sampling that depends on how we explore the system. And the state action space is too large, so we cannot compute exactly uh, the pre-function here, but we have to approximate it uh, with uh, some uh, parameterization, and typically it would be a neural network uh, in, in the following. So we we'll go toward a deep network, which is uh, maybe the most famous uh, deep reinforcement learning algorithm. So we have the free issue here. We cannot represent exactly this function. We cannot sample this guy, and we cannot apply uh, this equation for any, each state action per. So what we will do is that we will approximate QK plus one with a neural network, Q theta, and we try to learn uh, the weight theta, which are the weights of the connection of the neural network. So QK, which is in the update, uh, will be uh, a copy of the previous network. So we'll uh, keep both the network we're optimizing and a copy of the previous network. And we assume that we have access to a data set of transition. Uh, that have been uh, gathered by the agent while interacting with the system. So the transition are the state, an action, the reward associated to this uh, state action couple, and the next state. And we approximate the Q function by solving, so one step of value iteration by solving the following regression problem. For the problem of not being able to solve the problem for each state action couple, we will average over the samples available in the data set. So we have an empirical expectation over the data set. Because we cannot uh, compute the expectation over the next state, we will just use the next state we have in the data set, and, uh, and that's it. So it's uh, an empirical expectation. And for the last thing, the representation problem, we will approximate it with a neural network and we will minimize here uh, this uh, L2 loss. It can be a uh, Hubble loss, L1 loss, or something else, but we solve a kind of regression problem. So yes, uh, I, I just seen uh, the talk is recorded, I think, on the chat room. So, there are a few questions left uh, to go toward the practical algorithm. The first one is, how do you fill the data set uh, of transition? And well, the, the most obvious way is to fill it with the interaction you gathered so far. The second question is how to interact with the system. And here we have something called the exploration exploitation dilemma, because you're estimating a Q function and your Q function is a proxy to your uh, optimal policy because if you choose the action which is greedy according to the Q function, uh, you you act optimally, but according to your uh, uncertain model of the world. So you have uh, this uh, dilemma that says uh, from time to time you have to choose an action that you think is suboptimal but that can give you uh, additional knowledge about the world and uh, improve your policy in the end. So here, for the rest of the talk, we'll focus on a simple epsilon greedy policy, that is 
you throw a dice and we have a probability epsilon, you play random, and uh, with probability one minus epsilon, you, pay, you play the policy uh, pi k plus one, which is greedy according to the Q function. Uh, there are much more uh, smart uh, exploration, exploitation uh, schemes, but uh, it would be enough for the rest of the talk. And the last question is when to update the target network. In value iteration, you try really to, to compute, uh, to apply the Bellman operator, to compute it uh, as close as possible to, to what you would do uh, knowing the dynamics and uh, being able to sample uh, any state action per. But here, if you do uh, it too often, it will be quite unstable. And if it's uh, not often enough, uh, it will be too slow. So that's the problem of here. And this is a DQN algorithm. So you need uh, to know how, how much you will interact with the environment. As the update period is, um, uh, the frequency of uh, gradient update uh, of your neural network. And uh, no, um, the update period, sorry, is the frequency of update of the target network and the interaction period is uh, how much you, you will update your gradient. And what you do is that at each time step, you choose an action according to your uh, current epsilon grid policy. You apply it and you collect a transition and you will add this transition to your data set and uh, if uh, T mod F, so F is the interaction period uh, is zero, then you sample a random batch of transition, you compute the gradient and you apply it to uh, your parameters. And uh, each uh, C time step, you update the target network and that's it. And that's an algorithm that works uh, pretty well, but we will see how we can uh, improve it uh, quite a lot. So regarding the theoretical analysis, can, what can we say about uh, DQN? So DQN is a form of approximate value iteration. So an abstraction of DQN is just this uh, two equation. The first one is that you compute the policy as being greedy according to the Q value. And then you apply the Bellman operator plus some error epsilon k plus one. And this error is the difference between the actual update and uh, the ideal one. And this, this thing uh, is a function, a random function over the state action space. And one way to analyze uh, this kind of uh, dynamic programming scheme is to see how this error will propagate for iteration. At each iteration of the algorithm, you, you do some error. And what do, will you pay after k iteration of uh, doing uh, iteration with errors? The, the thing is that this kind of analysis uh, tells you this kind of thing, but it doesn't tell you how to control this kind of error. And uh, I, won't, I will not cover it uh, during this tutorial, but uh, that's one step ahead. Because each of these errors is a regression step, so you could uh, do some statistical learning theory to, to say how you control this kind of, uh, of things, at least in expectation according to some distribution. So here is the propagation of error. The quantity we will bound is the distance to optimality. So pi k is a policy computed by uh, your algorithm. Q pi k is a true Q function of this policy, not the Q k plus one that you compute, but the true Q function of this policy. And Q star is the optimal policy. And you want to know how far is your policy to the optimal one. And you will bound by something which is uh, made of three quantities. The second term is uh, what I call the rate of convergence, because if you have uh, epsilon equal to zero, that is you, you do uh, no error in uh, your algorithm, this is the true rate of convergence of the algorithm. And it's in gamma power k, so it's pretty fast. But you do errors, and you have an error term time um, multiplying, multiplying factor. And uh, this is the horizon term. So the horizon is the average horizon of the MDP is one over one minus gamma. Because when you discount, you you compute the sum of discounted reward. But an equivalent way of doing so is to say you interact with the system, and at each time step, with a probability gamma you continue, and with probability one minus gamma you stop. And when you stop, 
you compute the sum of undiscounted rewards. Uh, this is equivalent. And if you look at uh, the random uh, length of interaction, it's a geometric distribution of average one over one minus gamma. So that's why one over one minus gamma is the reason. And you have a square dependency to this reason. And this is quite huge because uh, in reinforcement learning, typically we'll take gamma equal to 0 0.99. So this guy is uh, 10,000. The, the square term here is 10,000, and uh, it's uh, it's quite big. And the but this dependency is known to be tight for uh, approximate value iteration. And the last term is the error term. So here you have a normalized uh, weighted uh, sum of norm of errors or a moving average of the norm of the errors. And a way to think how this guy behaves is that. Imagine that uh, the error term is zero mean and bounded. If you do, a, let's say, a Monte Carlo estimation with something which is zero mean and bounded, you will compute the true average. But here, even if it's zero mean and bounded, so a real uh, ideal case, uh, this quantity won't go to zero. The only way for this quantity to vanish is that uh, the error term in norm goes to zero uh, fast enough, uh, depending on gamma. So um, this means that even if you do value iteration and you only have a sampling error, no representation error, nothing, just sampling error, it won't converge uh, to the optimal solution. So Given uh, that we, we have seen uh, what value iteration is, we'll put some regularization uh, in it. So the first question is, what is regularization? And, and the aim of this talk is to explain what is regularization in reinforcement learning. So you can see the many next slides. Another question is, why doing regularization in reinforcement learning? And, and there are many ways to introduce uh, this concept. Um, for example, it arises uh, when uh, we frame reinforcement learning as a probabilistic inference uh, problem. Uh, it's sometimes introduced to favor uh, exploration. Uh, for example, you will say, "I want my to optimize my policy, but I want my policy to have uh, to have a high entropy, that is to be stochastic enough to to favor exploration, to do, to not be stuck uh, in a one suboptimal action." It can be used to, it can be um, motivated by a, a kind of smoothing of the optimization landscape. And I will uh, explain this a bit uh, further. It can be introduced as a kind of trust region for the policy update um, by uh, doing a parallel with a uh, gradient descent. And I, I will explain this further too. It uh, provides uh, some nice theoretical guarantees that I will show. and. Uh, first reason is that uh, it works very well empirically. So here the focus will be on the viewpoint of regularized approximate dynamic programming. Uh, it's maybe not the more usual one, but it's very convenient because it's kind of unifying abstraction that allows uh, first for theoretical analysis, but also allows for recovering uh, many existing uh, algorithms, if not all. So I will use some notation uh for the rest because they are convenient so we have a policy and the policy is a mapping from state to uh delta a is a simplex of our actions so to distribution of our action and pi dot q is literally a uh, component wise dot product and the sum of the probability of action going knowing state times the q value in the state action couple is the expectation of the q value for the state according to the policy. And PV is simply uh, the transition kernel applied to a value function. So with this notation, we can just write the Bellman operator, T pi Q as reward plus gamma, the transition kernel applied to pi dot Q, or the expectation of the Q value according to the policy. The policy, which is greedy according to the Q value, can be written as uh, the R max over uh, stochastic policy of pi dot Q. 
And I will use a lot entropy on cool by cloud body vagents in the following. So the entropy will be minus pi dot log pi, or the expectation of log pi according to pi itself, component wise. And the cool by cloud body vagents is pi dot uh, log pi over pi two, or log pi minus log pi two. And with this notation, we can write up symmetric value iteration as um, pi k plus one is a policy that maximizes pi dot qk, and qk plus one is the Bellman operator applied to uh, qk plus the error term. So I have a question here: Is probabilistic inference equal to Bayesian inference? Uh, not exactly. It's more like uh, seeing you can you can uh, say that the probability of the trajectory will be uh, roughly the softmax of uh, the cumulative reward of this uh, trajectory, and uh, then you will try to maximize uh, the probability of a given trajectory, which will be equivalent to to to, to search for the optimal policy. And with this point, you can do a uh, frequency approach or Bayesian uh, ones. And uh, it will give you uh, different kinds of uh, algorithm. So we'll start by putting some organization in the grid step. So the grid step is just that you search for the policy that maximize uh, the Q value. So if we put no regularization at all. So this is classic value iteration. Uh, we, we search for the policy that maximizes the Q value. So assume that the initial policy is uh, uniform. You compute Q1, and then you compute the greedy policy. And the greedy policy will be pi 1. And pi 1 will be in one corner of the simplex. Uh, the triangle is uh, simply uh, an abstraction of the simplex. And if you compute pi two, you will be uh, in another corner of the complex. So it's okay if you don't have error in the Q values, but if you do errors in the Q values, uh, it can be uh, harmful because we can do a parallel with gradient descent. Uh, if you do gradient descent with too big step size, uh, especially stochastic gradient descent, uh, it can be quite unstable and we will have the same problem uh, with uh, value iteration. We can put some organization with the entropy. So we compute the uh, maximizing argument of pi dot qk plus two times the entropy of pi. The, solution of this optimization problem can be computed analytically. It's simply the softmax of QK over tau. Uh, I'll, go, uh, I'll explain this later. And when you compute pi one, so in red, what you have is a policy which is maximizing the unorganized problem. And, and you, you look for something which is between the uniform policy, because maximizing uh, the, the entropy penalty is equivalent to saying that you don't want your uh, divergence to be too far from uh, the uniform policy. And then for pi 2, uh, you will have the same thing. So you will compute a uh, soft greedy policy that will be attracted towards the center of the simplex. Then we can do some uh, regularization with cool black libeler. And here it can be seen as a kind of trust regime method in the sense that you want to compute the greedy policy, but you don't want to be too far from the previous policy pi k. And here in the first step, it's equivalent as we have initialized the uh, value iteration scheme with a uh, uniform policy, uh, it's the same thing. But in the second step, instead of being attracted towards the center of the simplex, you are attracted towards uh, the previous policy. And we can use both. Uh, that is, uh, at the same time, the cool about divergence and the entropy. And uh, as before, uh, you have a kind of, um, of trade-off uh, between the greedy policy and the attractors uh, you have uh, in your organization. 
Another way of regularizing, which is uh, less frequent, is to say, instead of being ready according to the last Q value, I can be ready according to the sum of all past Q values. So your policy will still be in uh, one of the corner of the simplex, but uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. So to give you the insight why, uh, things are indeed more complicated, but assume that QK is just uh, the optimal policy, Q star plus some noise that doesn't go to zero. If you greedy according to QK, you will pay for the noise for each policy. But if you greedy according to the sum of all the QK, then uh, the error, given that they are IID uh, zero mean and bounded, uh, the sum of this error will disappear and uh, you will uh, end up with the optimal policy. So the question is, should we, so we modified uh, this step, the greedy step, should we modify the evaluation step two? And uh, the reply is uh, yes, even if it's not uh, usually done. So here we project some regularization. So I've talked about uh, entropy and uh, cool-back level regularization, but uh, many things I will uh, talk about today will, will deal with a generic uh, convex regularizer or the induced uh, Bergman divergence. So that's not that important, but you put some regularization here. And you can just consider the evaluation step. And this is what I call a type two. And this is what is done usually in the literature. But the thing is that when you do value iteration, you do a pi dot QK and you apply uh, the transition kernel to pi dot QK. So if you modify this guy, it makes sense to modify this guy too. Uh, this is uh, less usual in the literature. And uh, this is why I call a uh, type one. And the important thing, uh, we'll see it through the case studies, is that uh, it comes from for free. Uh, it's not uh, heavy computationally to modify also the evaluation steps, so this is a good thing to do, both uh, theoretically and empirically. So as a summary, we have a mirror descent value iteration, type one and type two. So type one and type two, depending on the regularization of the EV step, and this is called mirror descent um, in reference to mirror descent in a convex optimization. Because in uh, mirror descent, what you do is that you say, well, I want to optimize a function. I have a current estimate uh, of the optimal uh, optimum xk. And I will compute a linearization of uh, my function around xk. And I will uh, optimize for this linearization but you will end up in minus infinity. So you can say, well, I will put some organization saying, I want to optimize for the linearization, but not, not going too far from my current uh, estimate with some organization. And this is exactly what is done here. In this, if you interpret the Q value as a kind of, um, if you interpret the Q value as a kind of, of gradient, of something you would like to optimize, even if it's not uh, per se a gradient. And pi is your current estimate. So now we will uh, see two case study. The first one is on entropy organization, and the next one would be on Kullback lab organization. And we'll see how we can uh, go back from the, up, the abstract uh, regularized dynamic programming scheme to a kind of uh, DQN-like algorithm. So for um, entropy, we have this scheme. So in black, it's just a value iteration uh, from which we derived uh, DQN. And in red, uh, I've just added uh, the entropy term. And so the approach would be really the same as for uh, going from a uh, value iteration to DQN. And we will also consider continuous actions. And this is interesting because um, in DQN, you have a max over action of the Q value. And if you have a continuous set of action, you cannot compute easily this max. And we'll uh, also discuss the uh, theoretical guarantees you can have uh, for these schemes um, to be compared to the one we, we had for uh, value iteration. So 
If we look at the greedy step, pi k plus one is pi dot qk plus something, which is the entropy, and the entropy is a concave function, or the negative entropy minus h of pi, the convex function of pi. And so this optimization problem has a unique solution, and it's indeed the Legendre shell transform, or the math mathematical object uh, behind uh, convex conjugacy. So if you take pi dot q minus omega pi, and you optimize over here uh, the simplex, the convex conjugate is omega star, and the, so the maximum is the convex conjugate, and the maximizer is by properties of uh, this uh, object, the gradient of the convex conjugate. So this is a, a general thing uh, for whatever convex omega we have, but with the negative entropy, the convex conjugate is simply uh, the log sum x of, uh, of the Q value. And the policy or the maximizer will be the softmax of QK over T. So, and the log sum x is a kind of uh, smooth maximum. So the softmax is a soft argmax indeed. And the log sum x is a smooth maximum in the sense that if tau goes to zero, what we retrieve here is that we retrieve the hard maximum um, that we have in value iteration. So we're ready to derive a um, soft DQN. So for the ready step, we have just seen that the solution is softmax of QK over tau. So we can compute this uh, analytically. We don't need uh, an additional network. We have um, the QK network and we can uh, just compute it. And we just have to modify a bit the update rule of DQN. So we have pi k dot QK, Q theta bar. Q theta bar is the target network uh, of before. So this is uh, in black just DQN. But we want to take into account the entropy. And the, trop the entropy is pi dot uh, log pi. So here we just do pi k plus one uh, dot uh, pi log of pi k plus one, and uh, we have the entropy term. And we retrieve uh, the DQN of that rule when uh, the temperature goes to zero because this term will disappear, and this term will become the greedy policy. So we can end up quite easily with a uh, um, entropy version of uh, DQN. Uh, we can write it uh, equivalently as follow. By the Legend Fenchel transform, we have that um, the maximizer is uh, the log sum x. So we can just write uh, plus gamma times the log sum x of uh, the target network. And here again, when uh, the temperature goes to zero, we get uh, DQN back. So wh what will happen with uh, continuous actions? With continuous action, we cannot compute the softmax over a set of continuous action because the partition function uh, won't be computable. But if we cannot compute it analytically, we can still learn it. And uh, the idea is to add an actor. So the Q function is a critic, and the policy will be called an actor in the sense that the actor is a, the, the object which is acting with the system, and the critic is the object saying, uh, what you do is good or bad, bad through the Q values. So the first solution is a kind of direct approach. So we, we will parameterize the policy pi by our network, and uh, omega will be the parameters of this parameter uh, of these neural networks. So here we have pi dot uh, the target network. So the dot product, as I said before, is an expectation. And pi dot uh, log pi up to the sign is the entropy. So we have just to optimize for, for this quantity over the parameters omega. And we sample according to the empirical expectation, which corresponds to the, the state we have in our data set. The issue is that we cannot sample uh, empirically according to the policy pi omega because it's what we are optimizing for. So what we can do is that we can do important something. So we, we sample according to pi omega bar. Omega bar uh, is the 
target policy network. And uh, we will use uh, importance weight uh, correction, pi omega over pi omega bar. And uh, inside, it's the same. And we, we can just uh, do something like this. So we sample according to the old policy, we add the correction, and then we use gradient descent to optimize for this quantity. An alternative to the to important sampling, which is uh, used in practice for the entropy, is the reparameterization trick, where, um, for example, say your policy is Gaussian. So instead of saying that you will parameterize um, uh, that uh, if this guy is Gaussian, you will write it as a, a function of um, zero mean and um, zero mean uh, Gaussian noise, which allow um, avoiding this kind of uh, important sampling and reduce the variance of the two gradient. But I, I won't go further regarding this, uh, this aspect. The so some of the a solution is um, a kind of indirect approach, but it's in, indeed uh, equivalent. The thing is that we know analytically that the greedy policy is softmax of our, 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 uh, over our Q. So we can learn the neural network pi omega as minimizing the Kubak labor divergence between uh, the output of the neural network and what will be the analytical solution, except that we cannot compute the partition function Z theta bar here because uh, it involves uh, integration. But um, if you drew the, the calculus, um, this, this uh, partition function will act as a constant in the optimization process because you will have uh, um, the expectation of uh, pi omega time log of something uh, that is constant. So it, uh, according to the parameters of the policy. So you end up with uh, this equation, uh, which is the same as the previous one up to a uh, uh, normalizing factor. So we can estimate a greedy policy. And we have to change the evaluation step. But uh, the evaluation step is as before. We just modify uh, the DQN update rule by uh, adding the, the log policy to the Q value in the next state. Um, and, and that's it. So next, uh, I will address the theoretical analysis of, uh, of this uh, scheme. So as before, as for value iteration, I will consider something uh, which is abstract. Um, here, I don't consider that I do error in the greedy step, so it's, uh, it's just uh, for the discrete action case. And here I have this random uh, function, which is the error I do between the idle uh, update and the actual one. And the bound here on the right hand side is exactly the same as uh, the one for DQN. So we don't earn anything and we even lose something because by putting uh, entropy regularization, we bias the solution in the sense that um, we we'll converge not toward uh, the optimal Q function, but the optimal Q function of the regularized MDP. So to get some insight, if uh, the entropy term is very, very big. It means that you will uh, favor much more uh, having a uniform policy than uh, optimizing for the world function. And the solution will be almost uh, the, un the uniform policy. So you, you add some bias uh, by putting some uh, entropy organization, and the bound is not better. So regarding the propagation of error, uh, there's no there's no advantage uh, for doing this kind of regularization, but there are other arguments. Uh, one argument is exploration, and exploration is not covered at all by this kind of analysis. And exploration is because you say, I want to maximize my reward, but I want also to have a, a policy with a high enough entropy. So you will be stochastic, and then you can try things. Um, the argument regarding the optimization landscape, and uh, a way to understand this is that if uh, you optimize without regularization, you don't have uh, the unicity of a solution, and uh, the operator that associates to uh, QK, the greedy policy, uh, is not smooth, but 
whenever you add um, a regularization, you have unicity of this optimization process. And the policies, the greedy policies, the soft greedy policy as a function of QK will be a Lipschitz function. And because you, you earn this kind of smoothness, it helps regarding uh, the optimization on scale. So you have smoothness that can, uh, this kind of smoothness can also be uh, used to provide a better convergent bound uh, in some case. So this was for the entropy case. And now I will uh, deal with the Kubak label regularization case, uh, which is quite similar, except for the zero results. So instead of putting as an entropy, we put a uh, Kubak label divergence term between the policy and the previous one. And we also modify the evaluation step accordingly. So as before, we uh, have the same approach as uh, for going from uh, value iteration to DQN, and we'll also consider uh, continuous action and see what the theoretical guarantees can be. So if we look at the greedy step, as before, this is uh, the Kubak lab divergence is a convex function of a pi. So we have a Legend tension transform, and we know uh, it's an analytical solution, and the analytical solution is a softmax, as before, but weighted by the previous policy pi k. So pi k plus one is proportional to pi k times exponential qkm over lambda. But if you use an induction argument, it will pi k minus one times exponential qk times exponential qk minus one, so the, the exponential of the sum. So in the end, you will have uh, something which is a softmax over the scaled sum of past few values. And we've seen before that uh, regularization can, can be done through uh, the summation of past few values. And this is exactly what's happening here. And uh, the problem is that this quantity could be computed analytically with a linear parametrization because you could compute the sum of past few values by just summing the parameter vector, but not with deep neural network. Uh, not without remembering all past network, and um, it's usually too cumbersome. So as I said before, it uh, links uh, Kubak labor with uh, regularization by Q values, and it's uh, so reminiscent of uh, follow the regularized video in uh, online optimization or in uh, convex optimization. So to get a practical algorithm, can, what can we do? So this is a greedy step. And the thing is that even with discrete actions, we cannot learn the policy uh, exactly because uh, this will require remembering all past Q values or all past policies, which is uh, equivalent. So we can do as before. We just, uh, instead of just removing the log policy term of uh, what we're optimizing for, we also uh, add uh, the target policy term which uh, is a kind of encore. So the approach is exactly the same as before. Or we could say, well, we know that if I go back, what we would like to compute is the sum of past few values. So when you do a deep reinforcement learning, uh, you don't really have a iteration because you're quite optimistic when you, opti you, you change the target network. So doing a, a true average of past not past network is not uh, reasonable, but what you can do is that you can compute a moving average of a uh, past network. So we have a uh, H omega, and uh, the target, the regression target for this network would be one minus alpha times the target H plus alpha times uh, the current Q. So we replace the true summation of uh, past Q values by a moving average of past Q values. And for the evaluation step, as before, we just modify uh, the evaluation step by adding the pullback lab button, uh, which is just a, a difference of uh, log policies. And here, regarding the theoretical analysis, we have something which is pretty interesting. So on the right, you have a uh, bound for value iteration that I have shown before. And on the left, you have the bond for uh, value iteration but with Kubak level organization. So the first thing is that contrary to the case of entropy organization, 
we converge to, if we have convergence, we will converge to the optimal Q function. Uh, the scheme doesn't bias the solution asymptotically. Then we can compare uh, the, the rate of convergence. So for value iteration, we have a rate of convergence of gamma power k. And here we have a rate of convergence of one over k. So with regularization, it's slower. But by adding the Kullback Labor regularization, you explicitly slow down the convergence. So uh, it's something that was to be uh, expected. So yeah, I will. Um, someone is asking on the chat if uh, PPO or TRPO are instance of KL based one. Absolutely. And uh, I will uh, do the overview later. But indeed, um, it's not exactly this because it's a constraint rather than a regularization. But uh, it's even linked to what I'm saying uh, now. So the rate of convergence is worse. But now, if we look at the horizon term, so it's what it's the squared horizon one over one minus gamma for uh, value iteration, and we only have a linear dependency to the horizon uh, for uh, value iteration with KL regularization. And this is a strong improvement because uh, this horizon term is uh, easily equal to uh, 100. And it's known that for value iteration, without regularization, this dependency is tight. And as far as I know, there's no uh, lower dependency than a linear one to any uh, scheme that computes uh, optimal policy in an MDP. And the last term is the error term. And this one is interesting too. In the sense that here, as I explained before, what we have is a moving average of uh, the norm of the error. So even if your, norm, your error is zero mean and bounded, what you have is a, something that won't convert to zero. Here, what we have is that we have the norm of the average of zero. So if your error are bounded, this quantity and uh, zero mean, this quantity will go to zero. And this is illustrated uh, on this uh, empirical result. Here, uh, we have um, simple MDPs that are generated randomly, uh, where we don't have uh, any approximation error. We only have an estimation error that comes from something. That is, instead of computing the true expectation of the next state, we just sample one time the next state and we update uh, the Q function. So it's really uh, this came except that uh, we sample p instead of computing uh, it uh, exactly. And this is what gives a uh, value iteration. It doesn't converge. It doesn't converge because uh, this quantity cannot go to zero. And if we look at what gives a uh, back number organization, but in approximate value iteration for different value of the temperature lambda, you will have in all cases a convergence to uh, the optimal solution. So. This is a, a great uh, advantage of uh, regularization, of Kullback cool Labor regularization. It allows to implicitly uh, compensate uh, the errors you do uh, while learning your, your optimal Q function. So now I do a, a quick uh, overview of uh, the different way of organization. We have seen um, two case study with entropy alone, with Kullback label alone, and both case studies were type one. And uh, I go through uh, the different uh, way you can uh, combine things. So first, entropy type two. So you put uh, an entropy penalty in the greedy step, and you don't modify the evaluation step. So here, as I explained before, it's equivalent to computing the, the softmax of a Q value. So this uh, scheme is equivalent to applying, uh, to replacing the hard maximum by a soft maximum applied to QK. This is known as softmax decrean. And the thing is that even if you don't do errors, uh, this scheme might not be convergent. Even if epsilon is zero every time, uh, you can have multiple fixed points, uh, which means that uh, putting realization in the evaluation step is important, and it's not costly at all. And the Melomat policy um, is um, 
So I won't explain what it is, but uh, it's indeed a, a complicated way to, to just uh, add a log policy to, to the next few value. So if you do type one, we add the entropy uh, there in the evaluation step, and we still have uh, it in the ready step. So soft actor critic, uh, which is a well-known um, actor critic uh, in reinforcement learning, a soft key learning, uh, can be derived from uh, this uh, DP scheme. And indeed, we have uh, reviewed them uh, before. And the analysis uh, is uh, what I shown before. You have the same bound, uh, uh, except that uh, you will converge to something uh, different. Now, with uh, Kubak Lab Divergence Type 1, uh, it's what I presented before. So dynamic program, dynamic policy programming uh, is an old, uh, an old algorithm, um, well, uh, 10 years old one, that uh, was not derived from uh, this viewpoint, but it can be derived from uh, this uh, dynamic programming scheme. And uh, it's also a generalization of something called uh, speedy learning, uh, which was uh, also not derived at all from a KL point of view. So the equivalence here is um, that, as I said before, you can compute this analytically, and pi k plus one will be proportional to pi k uh, times uh, the exponential of qk, and so it will be uh, proportional to it will be a softmax of the sum of past q values. So you can write that alternatively this uh, dynamic programming scheme, where you say that the Evaluation step is the same, so the way you compute QK is the same as before. Um, you have uh, an additional HK, and HK is just computing the average of the Q values, of the past Q values. And your policy is just a softmax over the scale uh, H function. And uh, being softmax is equivalent to adding an uh, entropy penalty. And if you take this scheme, and if you take the limit as lambda going to zero, you get a speedy learning. And the analysis is what I shown before. Uh, basically, uh, thanks to this, you earn a convergence, which is not the case for value duration, if this quantity goes to zero. You can do cool-back level divergence type two, that is, you remove uh, the, um, the regularization in the evaluation step, and trust region policy optimization, uh, is a variation of this scheme and even more uh, maximum a posterior policy optimization, which is a little bit less known, but that works very well too. So for because there was a question on TRPO, the difference is that for TRPO, instead of saying, I want the policy to be uh, greedy, uh, soft greedy according to this scheme, instead of saying minus lambda is a cool back level divergence, you will say, I want to optimize for this quantity uh, under the constraint that the cool back labor divergence between the consecutive policy uh, is smaller than a given uh, epsilon, say. Uh, you can, as before, uh, compute uh, the equivalent scheme. So it's exactly the same thing as before. Uh, you keep uh, the same uh, evaluation, uh, evaluation step, but uh, here you, you just remove the organization very too. And uh, this scheme will uh, generalize uh, something known as the momentum value iteration, uh, which is itself a value iteration based variation of something called polytex. So, just to, to give you some insights, uh, we derived all this algorithm uh, from uh, the view of regularized approximate dynamic programming, but polytex was introduced from the viewpoint of uh, online learning with. Um, um, learning from uh, expert advice, something which is close to uh, follow the realized leader. And momentum value iteration was uh, uh, introduced by uh, taking inspiration from the concept of momentum in uh, gradient descent. So nothing to see with, uh, or, or small to, think, to see with uh, pullback labor organization. And the analysis here, uh, so the bound is uh, on the right hand side. Uh, this is just the average of the error, so that's fine. This term is a bit more complicated. Uh, uh, I don't give the details, but basically, you will uh, average the errors, but the errors will be preconditioned by the stochastic transition kernels implies, implied by uh, 
what you learned so far. And uh, yeah, it's uh, equivalent empirically. It's uh, much more cumbersome uh, to analyze a security key. But uh, yeah, it's comparable. What you can do is that you can consider at the same time uh, a callback labor divergence penalty and an entropy penalty. And something called conservative value iteration can be derived from this scheme. And thus, uh, advantage learning too. And advantage learning is something which is quite different. Uh, it just, um, I'll talk a bit about it later, but uh, it's mainly um, value iteration where you add some bonus to the reward, which will be uh, related to uh, the difference between uh, the Q value of uh, the current state action and the maximum Q value. Uh, you can write an equivalent scheme. So here, because you have entropy plus scale, instead of having a true average, you have a, a real moving average, as we used uh, uh, in the use case uh, as an approximation to the true average. So the moving average is indeed corresponding to uh, using uh, both entropy and scale. And uh, this generalizes uh, uh, momentum DQN. And if we look at the analysis, we have a bound which is similar uh, for uh, value iteration and for uh, this uh, scheme. But here the difference is that this uh, big E error, it's not the error you do at iteration uh, J, it's a moving average of all the errors you have done before iteration J. And with a moving average, you won't cancel variance asymptotically, but you will reduce it. So if beta is close to one, basically, uh, the variance of this term will be uh, proportional to one minus beta times the variance of uh, the initial error. So you will uh, have a better result in the end. And what we can do also is uh, removing the evaluation step, uh, the, the regularization in the evaluation step. As far as I know, there's no algorithm doing this, or at least not explicitly, because many algorithms did use some sort of pullback labor divergence regularization, and then they had some kind of uh, entropy regularization, at least in the code. Uh, so for the analysis, that's the same issue as uh, for uh, just uh, entropy type two, meaning that you can have a, a kind of Bellman operator that uh, have a multiple, uh, that has multiple uh, fixed points, the solution will be to introduce type three, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it's just uh, of uh, theoretical interest, so I will skip it. So we have a very, very good bounds for our Kubak cool Labor organization, but uh, there's an issue. And the, yeah, the hint is in the slide. The issue is in the greatest step, and I, I already talked a bit about it. So the bound I've shown, um, are not simple to derive, but they are based on uh, this scheme. So here, I, I just consider pullback labor regularization, but it's the same thing if you add a some entropy term. And the bound relies heavily on this equivalence to show the norm. And as I explained before, with deep neural network, we cannot compute this step exactly. It's possible with linear parametrization, but not with nonlinear parametrization. So we do error here. And if we do error here, we cannot say that the next policy is uh, proportional, is a weighted softmax of the Q value, because we cannot use the Lejeune function transform. So um, this equivalence won't hold. And we could say, well, if this doesn't work with this scheme, but if the bounds holds for this scheme, we can still uh, write a deep, uh, uh, deep reinforcement learning algorithm from this guy. But it's the same issue here. If we add some error, if we say HK plus one is the average plus some error, we lose the bound. The bound no longer holds. And the last thing is that we cannot do the real average. We can do a moving average because we, we are doing stochastic approximation when we do uh, deep reinforcement learning. So this is another issue. And this is, uh, that's a possible remedy. 
which is called uh, a recent work we did, which is called uh, intranet reinforcement learning. And the idea is the following one. Uh, here we have, uh, so the regular scheme written a bit. So we have alpha two times the KL uh, plus one minus alpha two times the entropy. And uh, it's of type one. And we can show, uh, it's quite easy to do, but uh, not uh, by hand. Um, if if we write, so we have this scheme with a, a Q prime, Q prime uh, QK, which is uh, what we, we've seen so far. And if I just write QK as Q prime K plus the log policy term, then we can rewrite this scheme equivalently as follow. So now the policy will be just uh, a soft greedy policy with an entropy penalty, that is uh, a soft max that we can compute analytically. And now we'll compute QK plus one, which is something which is no longer uh, homogeneous to Q value, but it will be the same update as uh, we've seen for a soft DQN, that is with uh, just entropy penalty, up to the fact that we add uh, the, the scale log policy to, to this term. And to this CVs, simply you can say that uh, here you have pi dot Q prime K, Q, Q prime K and uh, the Kubak lab divergence is pi dot log pi minus log pi k. So you can say that if you ignore uh, just the entropy term, you can say that it's pi q prime k plus uh, the pi dot log prime, and uh, you, you get this guy here, and just an entropy term is right. Uh, maybe it's a bit late for, for this kind of derivation. Without, <laughs> um, without having the, the equation written. But here, yeah, um, it just, in the end, a uh, soft DQN with uh, what we call the Munchausen term, because we, we didn't introduce it like this. And um, the thing is that you, you can see this as a kind of, uh, of um, a bootstrapping, um, in the sense that, um, you bootstrap the Q-value because you use an estimate of the Q-value in the next state to compute the Q-value in the current state. And here, we additionally bootstrap the policy uh, by adding it to the reward. And the, the, the core idea is that if, if you had pi star here, the log policy of the optimal policy would be uh, zero for optimal uh, action and minus infinity for suboptimal one. So just adding this to the reward, you know exactly what the optimal policy is. And instead of choosing the optimal policy, we just uh, use the current estimate of the policy. And as a bonus, uh, nice thing is that it also increases the action gap. So the action gap, this quantity here, is the difference between uh, the maximum Q value and the Q value of uh, the over action. And assume that your optimal um, for a given state, the optimal Q value is 10, and uh, the second optimal, uh, the second, uh, the value of the second action is very close. You can uh, confound these two actions because of the estimation error. And so it's interesting to have a, a large action gap because it's with a large action gap, it's easier to distinguish between the optimal action and the suboptimal one. And with this scheme, what we do is that we multiply uh, the action gap at, uh, by one over one minus alpha. And this all true with, uh, with uh, alpha converging to one in the sense that here, if you put alpha to one, and if you have no error in the evasion step, this guy will converge to something which will be uh, equal to the optimal value function for the optimal action and minus infinity for suboptimal actions. So here is a case study just to see how it works, and it's pretty simple. So we'll modify DQN with the Munchausen term to get Munchausen DQN. So this is, uh, yeah, I just write the, the, the regression target of DQN because DQN in the end is just a succession, a sequence of uh, regression steps. So here we have uh, the regression target of DQN. And we need a stochastic policy, so to add the mentions in terms, so we just add uh, some entropy organization. So it's something what we explained before. 
you, you modify the evaluation step and the greedy step give you a, a stochastic policy, which is the softmax over the target network. And then you add uh, the, the log policy uh, of the log and target policy. Um, but the log target policy, the policy is implicit because it's computed according to the, the Q network, the target Q network. And it's not the same as uh, uh, putting entropy organization because here the sign uh, changes and uh, it's not for the same state. Uh, here it's for the transiting state and here for the current state. But in the end, if you modify uh, even implementation of DQN, it's really a matter of not even of lines, but uh, a matter of uh, characters. So it's very, uh, a very teeny correction to the code. And if we look at the empirical result, uh, these are the result, uh, an aggregation of the result over uh, 60 Atari games of the arcade learning uh, environment. So yeah, uh, the arcade learning environment, I, I think everyone knows it. Uh, it's a collection of 60 games. And um, we put uh, aggregated score uh, normalized according to human. And we put the mean score on the left and median score on the right. So it's interesting to see uh, the median indeed because uh, some games are, are really, uh, you earn a, it's 100 times better uh, if you change a, a bit uh, the algorithm, but uh, it doesn't tell that uh, the algorithm is much better just because of one game. And so that's why uh, the median is interesting. So in orange, we have DQN. And in blue, we have Munchausen DQN. So we go from a score of uh, 230 to uh, 340. So it's a big improvement. And in green, what we have is a C51. So C51 is a distributional reinforcement learning algorithm. Uh, I won't give too much details, but uh, um, it's um, an algorithm that, that uh, really um, uh, works only with uh, deep learning. It has no interest in, uh, in uh, reinforcement learning with linear features. And the interesting thing is that C51 was never uh, uh, beaten by uh, an algorithm that is not based on distribution or reinforcement learning. And here we just modified really uh, a tiny part of, of DQN just by adding the log policy. But it makes sense because we are implicitly doing good back of our organization that comes with, uh, with strong performance bound. And in Median, we have uh, roughly the same thing. Uh, we own a lot. Uh, we almost double the score uh, compared to to DQN. And oh, here uh, you can see a per game uh, improvement. So uh, for the, the best games, we have a time two thousand uh, the score. Uh, for some game, uh, it's worse. So the game where it's worse, uh, we have uh, Elevator Action, Montezuma Revenge, Venture, Private. These are hard exploration game. Uh, this hard exploration game are a game where um, reward is really, really sparse. For example, in Montezuma, you have to uh, jump over uh, the void and then to get a key and then to open a door. And you have uh, some uh, points when you open the door only. Or when you get the key, you, you have already some points. But uh, to get there by chance is very um, difficult. And even if you get there by chance, because you, you put some organization, you, you won't be able to, to give us the information in this reward. So that's, that's normal that uh, it don't work well uh, with exploration game. But still, we improve uh, 53 over 60 games. And the idea is quite general in the sense that you have uh, IQN. So IQN is a value iteration uh, approach to based on distribution or reinforcement learning. And uh, we can just uh, apply exactly the same idea to IQN. It's not more complicated than for DQN. And also we improve uh, quite a lot the result of IQN, of uh, Munchausen IQN compared to IQN. Just putting the idea of organization, uh, but um, uh, only through a modification of the word. And in green, what we have is Rainbow. So Rainbow is an approach that combines uh, C51, 
uh, and uh, many tricks of different cosmic learning and rainbow was a state of the art uh, on uh, Atari. So uh, it does better than rainbow, at least on this configuration of the Arkham learning uh, environment, uh, which is not totally comparable to, to what uh, was published for the rainbow paper. So that's it, uh, it's time to conclude. So to sum up, uh, I provided an overview of realized approximate dynamic programming. And I think uh, it's a quite interesting framework because it allows connection to convex optimization and online learning. I've not talked so much about it. I said that uh, we have some connection to mirror descent. So equivalent scheme where we are summing uh, the Q values uh, have connection to dual averaging, and they are connection to uh, follow the regularized leader. Even if um, uh, this connection are, are not cosmetic, but um, we cannot uh, just apply the proof of uh, follow the regularized leader to analyze the DP scheme. It's a bit more complicated than this. Um, the good thing also is that it, uh, it allows recovering many uh, variation of regularized uh, reinforcement learning agents and show that many of them are indeed uh, very close in the end, even if they have been derived from a pretty different uh, point of view. Uh, it allows for a theoretical analysis and even a quite strong one, uh, especially when you, uh, you, you do a Kubak lab regularization. Uh, many of the bounds I've shown, not all of them, but many of them, uh, all true uh, if we change uh, KL by, say, um, a breakman divergence, but not the nice bound where you have a compensation of errors. And uh, by understanding what's happening and how to, to change it, uh, it also brings an agents uh, like functions and reinforcement learning where uh, we can uh, take advantage of the nice theoretical analysis and uh, make it work for different reinforcement learning. And the nice thing about mutual reinforcement learning is that it has strictly no interest if you don't have a neural network. With a linear parameterization, uh, this algorithm is not more interesting than just doing Kubak lab position. And there are many other possible outcomes for our regularization. So the first one, uh, which is not written but should be, is that uh, what we, we have done so far is that we have penalized for the policy and our deviation between consecutive policies. And the policy is a measure of uh, conditional distribution of action given state. And what would be really interesting is to punish uh, the divergence or some quantity of the joint distribution of state action couple. You don't only want to know uh, what action will take in one state, but you also want to know uh, in what state you will go uh, by following the policy, but it's much more complicated. Uh, there are possible outcomes in imitation learning. So the previous tutorial was uh, quite a lot about imitation learning, and there's a lot of organization uh, hidden in imitation learning. And many of the um, current approach, like generative adversarial neural network for imitation learning, uh, are based on uh, minimizing uh, divergence between uh, distribution uh, linked to the policies. Uh, it has uh, possible outcomes in uh, inverse reinforcement learning too, because um, in inverse reinforcement learning, um, you want to retrieve a rural function such that the policy you observe is optimal according to this rural function. This is a near post problem in the sense that um, um, for a given rural function, you may have uh, more than one optimal policy. So the greediness operator is not uh, smooth. And thanks to regularization, the greediness becomes smooth and the inverse reinforcement learning problem is uh, still a bit ill-posed, but less than uh, without regularization. It is very interesting for quite a topic today, which is offline reinforcement learning. In offline reinforcement learning, you want to learn not from interaction with the system, but from a log of interaction, and it's much more harder. For example, if you put a decan agent and you let it learn on, say, Pong, it will learn to solve the game of Pong. But if you uh, gather a lot of transition, even good transition, like you let decan learn uh, over a while, you gather all data, and then you let decan learn offline only from uh, inter from the data set and not uh, by interacting with the uh, environment. And in the end, 
it won't work or by chance uh, because um, when the agent interacts with the environment, you have a kind of auto-correction uh, in the sense that it will, uh, um, um, it will estimate badly some Q values, uh, so it will take actions that are not good, and then it will, uh, it will be corrected by the outcome of the environment. And the, the thing with offline reinforcement learning is that you can use regularization to say, I don't want my policy to go too far from what has uh, been used to generate the data set and then uh, have uh, some additional safety. And it can be, it could be useful for uh, other things like uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning or game theory, but uh, I think I will stop there and take uh, some question. Thank you for your attention. So I see some, uh, some question. So the question is, uh, pi.q minus the coolback library or pi k uh, given pi. So it's more pi given pi k in my case, and the sense of the coolback library divergence uh, makes sense. So uh, this optimization problem looks like looks a lot like uh, elbow objective of uh, VIE. And uh, yeah, pi dot qk looks like uh, the exponential, the, the expectation of q of uh, the log of the conditional uh, probability uh, for the reconstruction loss. Um, so, so does it become Bayesian reinforcement learning? And um, no, you're not asking too many questions. So no, it, it's not really by general reinforcement learning. Um, um, it's not an elbow bound in the sense that uh, we don't uh, lower bound or upper bound the, the uh, optimization problem we're looking for. It's really using the uh, pension, uh, the Legend Pension transform. And I think the closer connection is indeed to mirror descent. <clears throat> because when, when you see a just gradient descent of a given function, so you want to optimize for a function f of x, and uh, you can say, well, I have a given point xk, and I have my function f, and I will uh, compute a linearization uh, of my function using a Taylor expansion. So the linearization would be uh, the gradient of f times x minus xk. And you will optimize for this, and you will say, I don't want to go too far from the current estimate. So you, you optimize for the gradient of k f times uh, x minus xk plus the norm of, uh, say, x minus xk. And if you take the L2 norm as a regularization, then you will end up with a gradient descent. If you take a Kullback Labor regularization uh, between x and xk, you will end up with a uh, roughly a multiplicative weight update. And this is really in this sense, it's a kind of uh, optimization. Another way to see this is that if you do a uh, value iteration, you compute the greedy policy and you can have a, a big move, but you do errors, so you don't want to move too far. And it's, for example, how has been introduced uh, trust region policy optimization. So one of uh, the algorithm uh, covered by uh, this, uh, this talk. And uh, you say, I, I want to, to improve my policy, but uh, while uh, remaining close to the current one. So it's more related to this uh, optimization viewpoint than uh, to Bayesian reinforcement learning, I would say. Uh, okay. I have a couple of questions so, that are related, so I think I'll ask them together. So the first if, is if you've um, experimented with a policy gradient version of this Munchausen RL. And, and the second question is that, I mean, when people start doing deep reinforcement learning, almost by default, the, the first thing they try is, is PPO. So, so I was wondering, based on your theoretical, theoretical results, I mean, what... what uh, what would your advice be? What algorithm should you try 
instead potentially than than PPO, and and why? So, so for the first question, um, I have uh, presented things with the viewpoint of uh, dynamic policy uh, of um, of dynamic programming. And policy a policy gradient is not really dynamic programming. You can see this as a kind of uh, value iteration, uh, policy iteration in the sense that you compute the true Q value of the given policy and then uh, you improve the policy by doing a gradient step. But uh, it's not really a policy. Uh, it, it's not it's not really a value iteration. Um, no, uh, so so what I want to say is that uh, it's not direct to frame this as a policy gradient approach, but it, it can be used as a kind of uh, policy gradient like approach. No regarding uh, PPO, uh, PPO is not exactly covered by this algorithm by, by, by this analysis because uh, in PPO um, the rationale is to say. Uh, the way it was introduced is to say that uh, the um, the constraint the, the constraint of the Kullback lever divergence is a bit difficult to, to compute because uh, they had to use a conjugate gradient to uh, estimate the Fisher information matrix and so on, and uh, so they try to put some regularization instead of constraint. It was not working well, so they just put a kind of clipping of the value, and it works well in practice. Uh, now, uh, PPO is used uh, mostly in a continuous action setting, or at least quite often in a continuous action setting. Uh, the bound I shown and Munchausen reinforcement learning, it really makes sense for discrete action. We've not tried so far too much on uh, continuous action, but uh, it's not sure that it will work as well because. The good thing is really that we avoid to do the error in the greedy step, and that's why we enjoy the, the theoretical guarantee I have shown. But um, for continuous action, uh, it's less clear. And uh, there's also a question of sample efficiency of uh, PPO because it's on policy uh, in the sense that you will uh, collect trajectories and then update your policy and then collect trajectories and uh, you will uh, you won't reuse uh, the old trajectories you've collected so far, or not to all one. While here uh, it's uh, based on value iteration, so it's mostly uh, of policy and uh, more sample efficient, generally speaking. So there are pros and cons uh, for, for both approaches. Okay. Anyone else wants to ask questions? Okay, so it looks like there are no more questions. So, so thank you very much, uh, Mathieu, for your tutorial. It's very interesting and. Um, so we'll call the end to the first day of tutorials, at least for 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 this session. And uh, the tutorials will, will continue tomorrow with uh, with three more tutorials. Okay. Uh, goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you for the invitation. And for those who would have uh, questions afterward, because uh, it's a bit late, at least in France, uh, feel free to send me a mail uh, to chat. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. <laughs> Mikari is saying was uh, it was uh, amazing. I agree. <laughs> bye bye.